Thank you very much for the opportunity to present in this uh, online seminar. So I would like to start with our motivation to do the work we are doing. And this is of course related to also to the challenges we are facing. And um, the uh, CO2 emissions and the high energy demand in the building sector is certainly something which is um, uh, very important when we think about uh, climate change. And here we have the situation that it's not only the construction, but it's also the operation of buildings that causes high CO2 emissions. And uh, on top of this, we also face a, a resource uh, scarcity. And um, we have therefore also the demand to substitute less eco-friendly and energy demanding materials. And um, if we look into the, the possibilities we have here, uh, it's clear that um, we can make use of wood as a key resource for the transition to a bioeconomy. And our research uh, addresses in particular these questions. Um, of course, uh, on top of, of these um, general challenges, uh, we have also to uh, consider that um, if we want to go in this direction, we need to rely on sustainable forestry and also on a sustainable uh, value chain for the wood products. Otherwise, we cannot meet uh, the requirements. And in terms of our research, uh, it's important that we more and more focus on applying green chemistry, not in, not in order to spoil the, the argument that come along with our eco-friendly resource. And uh, we should also, of course, think that we come to um, improve material performance, that we are able to um, bring wood into new applications. So bio-based and bio-inspired materials are the way we think we should go in terms of uh, climate change mitigation. And resource, the resource wood, he has of course uh, various advantages as a renewable resource, which is CO2 storing, and it's uh, rather energy efficient in production and use. Uh, recyclability, of course, is also a very important topic and here I think we have certainly a lot of uh, improvement potential if we look uh, at uh, today's fact that uh, not much of wood is recycled so far. Um, but there, we are on a way, um, particularly also the activities in Sweden and Finland show us that we can go to with various new concepts for wood and cellulose based materials to achieve high performance of these materials, but also, and this is very important, new functionality. And this goes via the upscaling of various, various nanotechnological approaches, which at the moment, I think, uh, facilitate a lot the way of how um, we can think of wood products uh, in the future. And um, to mention a, a few examples here, and this I call uh, bottom-up approaches. So starting uh, with cellulose-based materials where we had an, a disassembly of the wood structure uh, beforehand, and then we, we come to a, a reassemble reassembled structure. Here I would just like to highlight, for instance, the magnetic uh, nano paper, which already showed um, more than 10 years ago that you can add this uh, functionality to the, to the uh, wood derived products. Uh, but it was always uh, um, a very important task to, to also be able to come to, to larger uh, assemblies and here I would like to highlight, for instance, the flow assistant organization of the cellulose nanofibrils into microscale fibers, like it was shown uh, by, by Daniel Söderberg's group. Other approaches in this direction are the, the for bottom up approaches, come of course with a lot of um, recent developments in, in the emerging field of, of 3D printing where you can see nowadays uh, uh, nice nanocellulose based inks 
which can then be used to, to, um, to print complex structures, which I particularly think are very important um, in the biomedical field. But of course, the aspect of um, upscaling is still an issue if you go to a, to a nanoscale first and then you have to uh, reassemble the structures. So therefore, we um, think always about a, an alternative approach, which I would call top-down approach here, and which I would um, in take in the analogy to what I presented before, I would take as uh, taking the tree as our natural 3D printer. So we have this nice hierarchical structure of the, the, the wood in the tree, which um, starts at, at the nanoscale of molecules and then goes via the cell walls, the cell, the tissue structure up to the micro scale. And if we take the wood as such, we and we, we are able to focus on this uh, nano and micro scale, we can somehow use the, the natural wood structure to upscale our modification and functionalization approaches while retaining the natural wood structure. And this has certain advantages. Um, like I show you in this, like I show in this slide. So on the one hand, you can make use of the large uh, structural diversity that comes along with uh, the wood tissue structure. So trees have very different wood structures. Of course, we are still remain in the framework of the natural produced uh, material, but there is a large diversity. And on top of this, um, we can profit a lot from the um, evolutionary optimization of wood as such. Because if you look into wood, it has to, you have two conflicting optimization targets. On the one hand, it is to be uh, mechanical stable. And on the other hand, it is to conduct a lot of water. So this means on the one hand, a very compact mechanical stable material. And on the other hand, a, a very porous material with a directional um, conductivity. And for many of our applications in particular, such an optimization is very interesting. If we think about porosity for functionalization, but also in terms of lightweight structures, which have um, very good mechanical properties. Of course, utilizing um, the wood in, in this way uh, um, also includes several uh, challenges. And this is particularly how to get access to the native uh, wood cell wall in order to bring in new material um, components for better properties or new functionalities. But here, even here, we can learn from, from nature um, and take bio-inspiration from, for instance, the hardwood formation, uh, because trees are also able to modify and functionalize their material, also the wood material, um, after it had been in use for quite some time. So there is a way of changing the wood cell walls even after they had been produced. And this is exactly what we also want to do with our modification and functionalization approaches and um, bring in uh, new substances, additional substances into the um, wood scaffold. Of course, it's also very um, challenging to um, do this if you think about the, the very compact bulk structure and we, we see when we look into the details of how transport takes place of such modifying agents, that it still, it can be go, go via the, the lumen of the cell walls, but also there might be some transport in the middle lamella. So this is still um, not entirely clear, but we need a very detailed understanding of these processes to also make uh, green chemistry based modifications. Um, for improving wood properties, I would like to give you here one example, which is um, the um, 
mineralization of wood, uh, which we do, for instance, to improve the, the flame retardancy. So um, here we also take inspiration from nature, uh, where we, we see, for instance, with bone, that we have a very, can have a very nice uh, um, performance, which comes from a hybrid material of a mineral phase and an organic phase. And uh, for wood, we don't want to improve the mechanical performance, but we can use this hybrid structure for uh, making uh, wood less flammable. And for this, we have um, uh, um, had a developed a mineralization process. It's a biomineral called struvite. So here you see a 3D animation of um, of the location of the mineral in the wood. And what you see in this comparison here, so it's a thin veneer of unmodified spruce. And if you have a, a single flame added to, to it, you see that even if you have taken away the flame, then it um, starts burning uh, very quickly. So if you look at the mineralized wood, and it's exactly the same um, way of approaching the, the veneer with the flame. You see that, of course, there's um, still it, it gets darker because uh, wood remains um, fl flammable, but um, here it cannot be easily ignited. So if you have removed the flame, um, the, the fire is not progressing any further. So that would be one example where you uh, use these concepts of uh, modifying the wood for um, a property which is very important, in particular if you think about the, the building sector, um, that you have uh, less flammable wood materials. But what is of course also very interesting in, in terms of uh, substituting other materials which are maybe less eco-friendly is that you also come um, to, to new um, applications where you may even use wood in, in, um, and utilize it in ways that have not been possible before. And this, of course, uh, requires that you um, add uh, new property profiles, that you add new functions to the wood. And here it's more about thinking of wood as a natural hierarchical scaffold in which you embed a certain functionality. And that with this, you go into the direction of smart wood materials, which I think can have a lot of potential in the future in collaboration with uh, smart building technologies, so smart home, that you have uh, mat wooden materials, which are um, uh, sustainable and add also to um, the functionality in a, in a building environment for living comfort and energy savings. And here I would like to give you also some examples of, of work that we did in the uh, recent past. And uh, one example relates to controlled directional uh, water transport, so very related to what I, what I said before in terms of utilizing also the natural properties of wood. In order to do this, we, we first thought of that we need a very um, nice wood cross section so that the, the pores, the luminar are not filled with dust or something. And therefore um, we uh, worked on uh, laser cutting um, approaches to have, as you can see here, a very nice cutted surface. And then for uh, working on, on this controlled directional transport, which is of course already given by the structure itself, we added some uh, chemical modification with a silent modified titanium dioxide nanoparticle solution. And after we had, uh, uh, had a thin layer coating, this was followed then by one-sided UV irradiation. I show you this here, so if you, takes a natural wood and you have here um, a water droplet um, which sits on the surface. We changed this to a more hydrophobic surface um, properties 
uh, with this solution so that you create a hydrophobic uh, wood membrane. And then if you take this membrane and you make a one-sided uh, UV irradiation, you get um, on the one hand, you, you re so where you do, do not do the treatment, of course you uh, retain the hydrophobic surface properties, but uh, with the uh, UV light, um, you change this and the other side uh, into a hydrophilic surface. And with this, you get a um, very interesting um, effect that um, a, a wa the water droplet is very quickly soaked through, the, through this wood membrane if you attach it to the hydrophobic side, but it's completely blocked when you attach it to the hydrophilic side. I show you this in a short movie. So here you see the water, which is directly transported from the hydrophobic to the hydrophilic side along this wettability gradient. And if you go to the other side, it's hydrophilic, therefore the water droplet is more spreaded on the surface, but it's not able to go through the uh, wood membrane. Uh, interestingly, you can also do this uh, against uh, uh, gravitation. So here you put the droplet from below and again it is uh, soaked through the wood membrane to the hydrophilic side. And this, you, if you do this on from, from the other side, so on the um, um, hydrophilic side below, then it doesn't work as shown also in the first video. And you can also do this uh, vertically, for instance, and I think this is the last video that I show you on this slide, which also displays this effect. Okay, uh, one possibility to use this effect would be that you take it as a, a Janus wood membrane uh, for fog harvesting. So here we had a, a experiment for demonstration um, where um, so fog was collected by via the surface and you see that the weight of collected water with this Janus wood membrane in the positive direction is by far higher than a native uh, wood membrane or if you have this uh, um, reverse effect or if you just have the hydrophobic wood surface. So that would be a, a possibility to, to collect uh, water from fog with, with this um, modified wood membrane. Since I have talked already uh, quite a lot about now the, the interaction with water, I would like also to come back to the, to the basis of this interaction. And um, I was always fascinated by the power of this water cellulose interaction, which you can also see here in this uh, uh, movie where um, you have this uh, wooden beam, which was watered and then by the swelling, um, which uh, then occurs that you split the stone, uh, a way of splitting stone, which was already uh, used, for instance, in ancient Egypt. And uh, this, this wood-water interaction is so powerful that uh, you can even see this when you make uh, dehydration and rehydration treatments of wood, that uh, you have um, a deformation of the cellulose uh, crystalline lattice, which shows you how how much uh, how, the, how how large the stresses are that are uh, that are generated. And um, of course, if we think about uh, the uh, utilization of wood, this dimensional instability is always taken as a as a disadvantage. But one may also think of making use of it, and um, making use of it also refers to the a very interesting aspect that comes along with this interaction. And this is that this wood-water interaction in fact means that you are able to deform quite substantially a very stiff material. And I think this is quite exceptional for wood. 
And therefore, it's also worth trying to utilize it in a better way than just trying to impede it. So again, a biological role model for, for a possible utilization of this effect is, uh, is a pine cone, which opens upon drying. And this is because you have here a B-layer structure where, uh, which is bending because uh, you, because of the, the cellulose microfibril in these cells here uh, dictates this deformation. And um, you can easily make a, a, a biomimetic structure from wood in this regard that you take uh, one wooden B layer with, with, uh, uh, where the fiber direction is along the element and one layer where it's perpendicular to it. So if you glue them together in a, in a wet state and you dry them, then likewise here for the pine cone, you get a bending of the structure because this layer here shrinks more in, in this direction um, of the element than the, the upper part. And then since they are tightly connected, you get this curvature. And this you can, uh, easily now um, further utilize as a bio-inspired deformable wood element. So here you just change the relative humidity in the environment. And since uh, the wood is going for an equilibrium moisture content, it is uh, doing, it's, it's performing this movement. And we have worked on um, structures for uh, using it, for instance, for our smart autonomous shading systems. A, a problem here is, of course, since it's a diffusion-based process, a bulk material uh, will also mean that, depending on the thickness, uh, that it takes quite a long time. So therefore, we worked in the direction of having coupled elements, like you can see, for instance, here in the uh, for this. Uh, movie taken from the, from the laboratory, where uh, you have a coupling of two elements in order to have a, a more rapid response. And we uh, tried this also outside with larger elements. Uh, and this is just uh, during um, the humidity change. So the drying over daytime that you get this, um, this shelter effect. And you see here in, uh, on the, in the back, that was, uh, uh, electrical driven sun shelter, so which opened also when, when we had this um, shading um, function uh, approached with this smart autonomous device. Um, another possibility to utilize this effect is that you use the, the self-forming part that I showed you before, but then you freeze it so that you don't have this reversible movement anymore. And uh, this you can achieve when you make first these B layers and then you stack them. So you glue them together because then this uh, former deformation is frozen, although you may have um, humidity changes afterwards. So, and since you anyway have to dry your wood when you have um, sawn the timber uh, and you go for the final product, you can utilize this in order to have a self-shaping element. And with this, you can pro uh, produce curved CLT parts. You can see this here for this, this larger element and uh, you can uh, yeah, produce various forms uh, via um, stacking these individual B layer elements that had been uh, due to the moisture change. And this was then uh, further used also for a nice uh, structure, which I show you on the next slides. So where you can have larger elements which are uh, curved based on this principle, in this case, it was a five layer CLT with two self-formed B layers and then uh, one final uh, elastically bent layer on top. And with this, um, colleagues produced uh, this uh, um, so-called Urbach Tower, which is a 15 meter uh, tall structure. 
and um, uh, which is was mainly made from this uh, curved CLT elements. And you see it here. It's in a Gartenschau near um, near Stuttgart, and it's a was uh, it's a very nice. Um, structure, um, which yeah, is, is, is a very impressive architecture. Another aspect that I would like uh, to mention in this talk is densified cellulose materials. So uh, I already mentioned that uh, we can profit a lot from the hierarchical structure of wood, but also from its porosity. And it's very interesting also to go towards uh, pre-treatments like a delignification, which even allows us to make the wood more accessible and also to increase its porosity. And uh, if you don't do this delignification, not like in a, a paper process, but that you, um, that you retain the hierarchical structure of wood, there are uh, various advantages that uh, come along with this because you, you keep the, the natural fiber directionality. On the other hand, um, the transverse rigidity of the cell walls go, goes down. And with this, it's, for instance, also uh, much easier to uh, go through a densification treatment to then getting um, very, a, a much higher mechanical um, stability. So this, this concept of utilizing the hierarchical structure in cellulose scaffold materials was, uh, for instance, uh, used or is still used uh, by, by, by the group of, of Lars Berglund for the transparent wood. Also, um, the group of Bing Hu has used this for making um, this highly densified and, and very strong materials. And we also uh, work in this field. And uh, our approach was to go via a full um, delignification. And then you get this very white uh, material, which is also very nicely shapeable. So you can, can easily bend it in the wet state. You can twist it. And uh, the fibers are never cut. So they always nicely follow um, the, the geometry. Likewise, we also know from, from trees when you have curved elements that are grown. So there you also have the very um, well aligned uh, uh, fiber direction uh, in, in these uh, geometries. And uh, what is, so the, the, main, the main basis of this uh, that you can, um, can shape these materials, but also that you can uh, switch between a, a locked and a, a morphing or, or a, a deformable state is that in the dry state, when you have delignified the, the, the wood, so there are, there's no lignin anymore as a glue between the, um, the, the cells, but you have a, a lot of hy um, hydrogen bonds and you have also a physical interlocking of these cells. So if you add then water, to this structure, water can go not only in the cell wall, but also between the cells, like you can see here. And this allows you then to, to shape, to, to reshape it. And then when you dry it again, then um, this shape is retained. And this means, of course, in the dry state, you have also a very, very good mechanical performance, but uh, you lose this. Uh, this mechanical strength uh, when you wet the samples. This possibility of, of shaping the elements can be very interesting uh, when you also, again, take bio-inspiration. If you think of um, how a, a branch is, is connected to the stem of a tree, you, you have a, a perfect uh, fiber alignment around this um, this branch, and you can also easily deform this uh, cellulose structures. You can even make density gradients, for instance, that you have it more compact and shaped in, in these parts. But of course, 
uh, the the wettability aspect and shapeability aspect also uh, comes along with a problem and this is what I mentioned already before is that you lose the mechanical performance when wetting it. So therefore uh, a possibility is to to impregnate the cellulose scaffold with a, with a polymer. Uh, ideally that would be and this we are working on uh, for, for um, in the future, is to have a, a bio-based polymer which you infiltrate here uh, just to show the principle we worked um, with epoxy which is of course not um, ideal in, in this uh, sustainability argument but it shows you very nicely how you can profit from this hierarchical structure of the, the wood scaffold when making these uh, uh, composite structures. So first we have the delignification then we have an infiltration step, and then we uh, densify these materials. And what you can see here is how uh, some details on how the, um, how, how the epoxy penetrates the cellulose scaffold. And what is quite interesting, and this is a point which I would like to emphasize here, is that you have, um, you have an interconnection Wire uh, the boarded pits in the in the woods in the spruce structure in this case. So the as you can see here in, in this image, the epoxy resin is not able to enter in these um, strongly interlocked regions between the cell walls or between the cells, but it's it's penetrating into the lumen of the cells. Uh, since the pits are all opened. Uh, because they are um, have also gone through this delignification process, the 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 uh, resin front is then going from one cell to the other, and with this it creates an interpenetrating uh, polymer network inside this hierarchical um, structure, which then results in very uh, good mechanical properties and which is also uh, then by far more water stable than the, the natural cellulose scaffolds. So regarding the mechanical performance, you see here that if you uh, increase the fiber volume content uh, to, to a very high extent, then you can go to uh, more than 60 gigapascal in tensile modulus with these materials. And also the tensile strength is in the in the um, range of 500 to 600 megapascal. So you you uh, produce a very um, uh, a very good performance for these um, uh, cellulose uh, resin composites. Final aspect uh, regarding functionalization for such um, cellulose materials is uh, an example on enhancing the piezoelectric properties of wood. And uh, the basis here is that uh, wood has also in its natural state a uh, piezoelectric effect. And this relates to the uh, semi-crystalline structure of the cellulose. But you cannot easily utilize this because wood is um, so stiff and you have not enough uh, deformation to have a, 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 a strong piezoelectric effect. In this case, we delignified uh, balsa wood and um, this lignin removal, because we have so thin cell walls also uh, results in a partitional uh, breakage of the cell walls and you get this laminar structure here of cellulose, uh, cellulose yeah, of the cellulose scaffold. And as you can see here in, in various cycles, you have a, a large deformability that goes along with this, but you always um, uh, uh, have a, a deform so an elastic deformation that you go back uh, to, to zero strain in the end. And um, based on, on, on this deformability, you have then uh, a much enhanced piezoelectric uh, effect compared to the natural balsa wood. 
so uh, that you can can reach a, a certain voltage. The current is of course still very low because we have also not an electrical conductive material, but this combination could be interesting also for the future. And what you can also see that there's probably a possibility to exploit this effect um, as a sensor because there's a correlation between the stress you apply and the voltage output that you gain. So this was one uh, final example on how we utilize this uh, delignification treatment also to add additional functionality. What I think is also nice in this regard is that it was just a delignification treatment and you enhance by this a natural effect that is already existing. With this, I'm at the end of the presentation and I, I would like to finish with this uh, chart on the development of materials uh, from uh, Mike Ashby. And I think it, it is very important to be uh, aware that um, when we think about what has to come in terms of uh, climate change mitigation and the reduction of CO2 emissions. So we have to, to move into a direction of bio-inspired and bio-based materials. And I think what, what this um, chart is showing us is that things can change. And I mean, this is of course a, a time scale of, of 12,000 years, but we, we have seen that, um, that the importance of materials has changed drastically over this period. And of course we have to speed up in this change now, but uh, it also shows us that if we uh, work in terms of research and uh, implementation on getting bio-inspired and bio-based materials at the forefront of this transition to a, to a bioeconomy, um, then there's also a chance to have a very uh, efficient uh, climate change uh, mitigation. This you for uh, uh, attending. Also, I could not, not see you. And I would uh, like to thank my colleagues at ETH and uh, EMPA, the Wood Material Science Group, the Wood Tech Group, uh, and of course, uh, funding organization. Thank you very much for your